Today we're going to be talking about how to find the arc length of the parametric curve. And in this particular problem, we've been asked to find the arc length of a parametric curve and also to compare it with the distance traveled by the particle in the given time interval. So in this particular problem, we've been given the parametric equation defined by the equations x equals sine squared t and y equals cosine squared t. And we've been told that we're interested in the arc length over the interval t greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to three pi. In order to calculate the distance traveled by the particle, we're gonna be using the distance formula here. In order to calculate the arc length of the parametric curve, we're gonna be using this formula for arc length of the parametric curve, L equals the integral from alpha to beta, et cetera, of this function here. We're going to use the distance formula first, and in order to use it, we need to go ahead and eliminate the parameter. Keep in mind that we're trying to compare the arc length and the distance at the end of the problem. Hopefully they match. So in order to find the distance traveled by the particle, first we'll go ahead and eliminate the parameter. The way that we're gonna do that is by solving x equals sine squared t for t. So we'll go ahead first and take the square root of both sides. Doing so will give us the square root of x on the left side and sine of t on the right side since we had sine squared t, we're just left with sine of t. Now if we go ahead and take arc sine of both sides, we're left with arc sine or sine to the negative one of the square root of x is equal to arc sine of sine, cancels those two out and we're just left with t on the right hand side. Now that we have this value for t, we can go ahead and plug it into our equation here for y. So we're gonna plug this value that we got for t, arc sine of the square root of x, in for t into our equation for y here. So we'll get y equals cosine of arc sine of the square root of x. And this whole thing here is squared because we have this cosine squared right here. So we keep that, that squared. Now I've gone ahead and written the formula for cosine of arc sine. Whenever we have that, we can transform it into the square root of one minus x squared. Keep in mind that this x value here comes directly from this inside the arc sine here, these x values, that's where you get this x value in this conversion formula. So what we have to do is take our value for x, which happens to be square root of x, because that's what's inside of our arc sine function, and put it underneath this square root sign here. So we simplify this by saying y equals, and now this whole thing goes away here, cosine of arc sine of the square root of x, we end up with just the square root of one minus the square root of x, squared and of course we're still keeping this squared exponent on the outside here now we can simplify this obviously when we square the square root of x we just get x so y equals the square root of 1 minus x and this whole thing here will be squared when we simplify of course the square root and the squared exponent here will cancel and we'll get y equals 1 minus x now we have an equation that's real easy to work with. If we go ahead and graph this on an xy coordinate plane like this, what we find is that we have the line, we'll define two points here like this. We have a line that looks roughly like this and the points, the intercepts on the axes here, this point right here is the point zero, one and this point right here is the point one, zero okay so that's our line those are our intercepts now we're interested in the interval where t is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to three pi so with this method what we need to do is figure out where the particle is on this time interval so we can make a little basic chart here we'll say t on one side and then x y the point x y on the other side because we're interested in the coordinate point of the particle at a given time t and we can say here zero pi over two, pi, three pi over two, two pi, etc. right? And we would wanna go all the way down to three pi. So what we wanna to do to find the coordinate point to see where the particle is at each of these given time intervals is plug them into our parametric equation. So if we plug zero in to our equation here for x, we're gonna get the 
x value of this coordinate point. So when we plug 0 into this equation for x, what we get is sine squared of 0. Well, sine squared of 0 is just 0. So the value here for x is 0. When we plug 0 into our equation for y to get the y value of this coordinate point, we get cosine squared of 0, which is just 1. So what this tells us is that at time 0, the particle is sitting at the point 0, 1, which is right here. The particle is right here. Now if we plug in pi over 2, what we find is that we get an x value here, sine squared of pi over 2 gives us 1, and cosine squared of pi over 2 gives us 0. So that tells us that at pi over 2, the particle has moved from the point 0, 1 to the point 1, 0. So it's moved along this line here to the point 1, 0 and ended up at this point here. If I go ahead and plug in pi, and I'll let you do this, but what you find is that it moves back to the point 0, 1, and then back to the point 1, 0, and then back to the point 0, 1, etc. And what we find as it's oscillating back and forth between 0, 1, and 1, 0, it's just bouncing back and forth between these two points, it bounces back and forth six times, right? Because we want to go from 0 all the way to 3 pi. So we would have here below 2 pi, I ran out of room, but we would have 5 pi, over 2 and then 3 pi. So we have intervals here. As it moves from 0 to pi over 2 right here, that is one length or one movement between these two points. As it moves from pi over 2 to pi, that's 2. As it moves from pi to 3 pi over 2, that's 3. This is 4. From 2 pi to 5 pi over 2 is 5. And from 5 pi over 2 to 3 pi is 6. So it moves back and forth across this line six times. So what we can do is use the distance formula to find the length of this line right here and then multiply that by 6 and that'll give us the distance traveled by this particle. So to use the distance formula, which we've written here, d equals, we'll have d equals the square root, and we can just go ahead and write it out like that. Now we have the points x sub 1, y sub 1, and x sub 2, y sub 2. So let's go ahead and call this point right here x sub 1, y sub 1, and we'll call this point here x sub 2, y sub 2, and we can just plug in those points to our distance formula. So x sub 2 we know is 1, that's right here, so we've got 1 minus x sub 1 is 0, This the x value on this coordinate point here, 0. We'll square that and then we'll add to that y sub 2, which we know here to be 0, minus y sub 1, which we know is 1, and we'll square that also. Now when we simplify this, notice that inside the square root we get 1 minus 0 squared is just 1. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. When we square it, it's positive 1, so we get 1 plus 1, and the distance equals the square root of 2. But remember that that's just the distance between these two points. We know that the particle travels this distance 6 times, so we multiply this by 6, and we get a distance of 6 times the square root of 2. And that's the total distance traveled by the particle using the distance formula. So we'll go ahead and say d equals 6 times the square root of 2. Now we want to compare that to what we get for arc length using the arc length formula for L. So when it comes to using this formula for arc length, we're going to say L is equal to the integral from alpha to beta. And you might be tempted to use alpha and beta as 0 and 3 pi respectively, because that's the interval we're interested in. But remember, the particle moves back and forth on intervals of pi over 2. Remember that chart that we made and we said at time 0 it was at one point, and then at time pi over 2 it was at the other point, and then at pi it had moved back to the original point. Well, those were intervals of pi over 2, so we actually want to say the interval from 0 to pi over 2, see what the arc length gives us, and then we'll multiply that by 6 because we know that the particle traverses that distance 6 times. So we'll say 0 to pi over 2 of the square root. Now here we have dx over dt. That's the derivative of our x function with respect to t. So what we're looking to do for dx over dt is take the derivative of sine squared t. Well, we can do that using the chain rule. If instead of calling this sine squared of t, we say that this is sine of t squared, like this, then we can use chain rule to find the derivative. So we'll take the derivative of the outside function first, we'll bring this exponent down here in the front, and we'll get 2 sine 
of t now to the first power. We leave that inside function completely untouched, but then we have to multiply by the derivative of this inside function. The derivative of sine of t is cosine of t, so we get cosine of t like this. And this is of course squared because we get that it's squared from our formula there. Now for dy over dt, we're looking to take the derivative of our function y equals cosine squared of t. Again here, we can call this instead cosine of t squared. And when we take the derivative, we'll again use chain rule. We'll bring this two out in front here. We'll get two cosine of t now to the first power. And we'll leave that inside function completely untouched. But now we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of cosine of t is negative sine of t, so negative sine of t. So when we multiply all of this together, we can see that our derivative is negative 2 sine t cosine t. And we're going to square that according to our formula. We're taking the square root of that whole thing. We've got our dt out here. And now you can see that it's just a matter of simplifying this integral until we can evaluate it. In order to do that, we're going to call this the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of the square root. Let's go ahead and square both of these terms here. So 2 sine of t cosine of t squared is 4 sine squared t cosine squared t. And then here, same thing. When we square this negative 2, we get a positive 4. So we'll get plus 4. And of course, these become sine squared t cosine squared t and we can put all that under the square root sign. What we see that we have now, we have 4 sine squared t cosine squared t plus 4 sine squared t cosine squared t. So we can just go ahead and call this 8 sine squared t cosine squared t and get rid of this second term here. We just combined those. So now we have an 8 here. At this point, it's easy to take the square root because we have a perfect square in sine squared t and in cosine squared t, and we know that the square root of 8 is 2 times the square root of 2. So what we get here is the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 2 root 2, that's the square root of 8 there, times sine of t times cosine of t dt. Now at this point, we can go ahead and pull the square root out in front of the integral. We'll get square root 2 times the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 2 sine t cosine t. And the reason that I left the 2 inside the integral is because we can now use the substitution formula here, 2 sine t cosine t. This is a double angle formula. That's equal to sine of 2t. So this integral then becomes the square root of 2 times the integral from 0 to pi over 2. And at this point, we can just substitute sine of 2t dt. And that's actually something that we can take the integral of. So when we take the integral, it's important to remember that we need to use chain rule here. We know that the integral of sine, ignoring this 2t here, the integral of sine is negative cosine of whatever's on the inside. So we'll get square root of 2 We'll get negative cosine, negative cosine of 2t. We ignore that inside function. But now we need to go ahead and divide by the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of 2t is 2, so we need to divide by 2. So we're going to actually go ahead and multiply this by 1 half. That's the same as dividing by 2. So we divide by 2 there, and then we're going to be evaluating this on the interval 0 to pi over 2. And remember that we're actually going to be multiplying this whole thing by 6 at the end because we've just done the interval from 0 to pi over 2. So what we'll get here when we simplify this is negative root 2 over 2 cosine of 2t evaluated on the interval 0 to pi over 2. And we're going to be multiplying this whole thing by 6. We'll go ahead and put 6 out in front there. When we evaluate on this interval, we always plug in the upper limit of integration here first and then subtract whatever we get when we plug in the lower limit of integration. So we'll plug in pi over 2 first and we'll get 6 times negative root 2 over 2 cosine of 2 times pi over 2. 2 times pi over 2, the 2's will cancel and we'll just be left with pi. So we get cosine of pi and we know that cosine of pi is negative 1.
So that's what we get when we plug in pi over 2. Now we're going to subtract whatever we get when we plug in 0. So we'll get minus a negative root 2 over 2. That's going to be a positive root 2 over 2 cosine of 2 times 0. Well, cosine of 2 times 0 is cosine of 0, and cosine of 0 is just 1. So we'll get this here multiplied by 1. As you can see in this first term here, we'll get these negative signs to cancel. These will both be positive, and we're just left with root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2. That's going to give us 2 root 2 over 2, and our 2s will cancel. We'll just be left with square root of 2 for this whole inside function. And as you can see, since we're multiplying by 6 here on the outside, we have 6 times root 2 for our final answer. And that's very cool because that looks the same as what we found before, 6 root 2. So you can see that using either the distance formula to calculate the distance traveled by the particle, or the arc length formula to calculate it using a little bit more advanced calculus, either way you find the distance traveled by the particle on the time interval 0 to 3 pi.